carrying on in God's Word through the book of Hebrews. So if you have your Bibles, I'll encourage you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4. I'm going to read, uh, to begin with, uh, Scripture, the Hebrews chapter 4. Last week we looked at the first 11 verses of Hebrews uh, chapter 4, but today we're going to look mostly at uh, the last few verses there, but I want to read the whole chapter again. So I know you just sat down, but if you want to stand up, we're going to start doing this. If we could just stand up for the reading of God's word. Um, We're going to read Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 to the end of the chapter. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now we who have believed enter that rest, just as God has said. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day, God rested from all his works. And again, in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. Therefore, Since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God again set a certain day calling it today. This he did when a long time later he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much that Jesus is our great high priest. We thank you so much that your word is living and active. We thank you that, Lord, even though we do live and and we worship and we are thankful for the fact that you created us and that you love us and that you know every intricate detail of our lives. Um, Lord, you made a way that your throne would not be a throne of judgment and of condemnation, but that your throne would be a throne of mercy and grace. And Lord, that we are invited, we are welcomed, we are urged to come forth and to approach your grace, your, your throne of grace, your throne of mercy, and ask for all that we need. And so, Lord, we ask even now that as we look into your word and as we um, just unfold the passage and and, and try to understand it more clearly, that, Lord, you'd speak to us this morning through the power of your Holy Spirit. That your Holy Spirit would speak to our our minds and to our hearts, to everything that we are, Lord, that we would be encouraged, that everybody who came in here this morning would walk out of here um, this afternoon and, and be encouraged, Lord, that, uh, that, that there is a God who loves them and, and welcomes them to come to his throne. And so I pray even now that uh, you just speak to each one of us and you know what, where people are at today and I pray that whatever they're facing, you would encourage them to know that they don't have to face that alone. Um, so speak through me at this time and speak to the hearts of your people, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> So last week, we, did this, we talked a little bit about this concept of rest. What does it mean to rest? Well, when I hear the word rest, I think of like, okay, I'm tired. Uh, it's been a long day. Um, it's now about 11 o'clock at night. I like to go to bed a little later than probably some of you. 
um, 11 o'clock at night, um, I'm ready for a good rest. I'm ready to just, you know, get under my warm covers and go to sleep and hopefully I'll just have a nice rest and wake up the next morning about eight hours later and I'll be rested and I'll be ready to tackle the next day and whatever it is before me. That's kind of what we think about a rest, right? Now here, that's not really what this passage is talking about. It's not talking about literal sleeping, okay? It's, it's talking about the rest that we can have if we are in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. If we are in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, all of a sudden we can rest in certain things. We can rest in the fact that whatever it is we're facing, he's got this. He is in control. And then as we talk about, you know, Mike was referring to things going on in our world today. Some of us, I, I'm one of them actually. I don't really love to, to read the news and find out current events and find out what, because I just feel like it's so easy for it to just kind of become discouraging. For it to become, oh man, like is there no end to the amount of problems out there in the world today? And I got enough problems in my own life, so I really don't need to hear about all the problems all over the world. Right? And so, I don't know, some people are really interested in that. But what we can rest in is knowing that God is in control and knowing that, that when these things seem to be just unraveling at the seams and everything is falling apart all around us, actually in God's design and under his control over things, they're actually falling into place. And that's what, you know, we talk about a, a glimpse into the future. This is, this is true. These things that are happening are, and we can rest in that. We, we can rest in the fact that we don't have to be these anxious individuals pacing back and forth, pulling what little hair we still have left, right? I don't have much. But, you know, we can pull whatever little hair we got out of our heads. Some of us have more nuts. And, and, and just be stressed and just be anxious and just be overwhelmed. We don't have to live like that because we can rest. We can rest in knowing that, yes, one day we will all die and we will all face judgment. That is what the Bible tells us. It says that just as man is destined to die once and after that, judgment. Judgment doesn't sound very pleasant. I don't want to be judged, right? Well, we can rest in knowing that, that Jesus is the perfect sacrifice and that he takes away all the sin of the world and we can rest in that. There's so many things we can rest in. But at the same time, the author of Hebrews is saying here, be sure that you don't miss the rest. Don't fail to enter into the rest. Because it's not a given. It's not an automatic. It's not everybody's going to enter into the rest because the rest is available to all and, and so everybody's going to enter in. There's, gonna see, there's, there's one thing that will keep you from entering into the rest. And what is that? Unbelief, right? Makes it very clear. In uh, the end of uh, chapter 3, talking about this illustration of the Israelites and how they failed to enter into the rest, it says, why did they enter into the rest? Verse 19, chapter 3 says, so we see that they were not able to enter the rest because of their unbelief. So we need to put our faith in, in Jesus. And as we put our faith in Jesus, we all of a sudden begin to, be, to experience this rest. And then that rest becomes fully ours when after this life we enter into the presence of the Lord. And so that brings us now to verse 12. This is kind of what Hebrews has been talking about up until this point. Now we come to verse 12. And in verse 12 we read about God's word. It says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. I'm sure you've heard that verse probably quoted before about God's word. You know, that, that God's word is like a sword. And when we think about a sword, I don't know about you, but I get this picture in my mind of like a sword, like a, a knight from like the Middle Ages, you know, with this big sword just wielding it back and forth and just causing untold destruction with this massive sword. Well, this sword that the Bible is compared to is, is not really one of those big, long swords that just cause, you know, random destruction. This is a sword that's it's, it's more like a, a, like a dagger or even more like a scalpel that a, that, a, that a surgeon would use. And it's used in a very precise way. And it talks about how it, it divides soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. In other words, what the word does to us is it goes down deep into us. 
And it reveals from within us the truth about our actions, the truth about our motivations, the truth about our thoughts, the truth about why we're doing what we're doing. This is what the word does. This is what it's saying it does. And that's important. Because the Bible tells us that the heart is um, deceitful. You know, you probably heard people say, well, you know, in life, what we should just do is, some people maybe have this on their bumper sticker or maybe a, 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 a little nice picture on the wall somewhere, and it says, you know, trust your heart. Just, just trust your heart. And you, if you trust your heart, everything is going to be good, and, and, and you know deep down in your heart what you need to do in life, and you just need to get in tune with your heart, and if you trust your heart, it's all going to go well. We, we, we hear that kind of a thing in our world today, and I think that's got to come from, not the Bible anyways, because the Bible tells us that Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? So in other words, there are times where we're going to think we're doing the right thing, and in reality, we're doing totally the wrong thing. Not only is our heart deceptive, but also sin is, 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 is deceitful. Sin is deceitful. You, you might notice today, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can be duped, how we can be deceived, how we can think that we're going in the right direction and we're actually going in the wrong direction. And a lot of times when you hear a sermon about that, all of a sudden, the main character of the sermon becomes Satan. Because Satan is like the great liar and the deceiver and all these things that are true about Satan. But you know, like Satan could die today and never rise again. And we still got enough of our heart and of sin itself to deceive us without him, even him getting into the picture. You know, he's not in this passage. Because um, we have enough in our, in, in our hearts and in sin itself to deceive us. Do you know why people sin? Like, does anybody sin because they're like, well, I can see that that's going to be a very self-destructive path for me to take, but oh, I'm just going to take it anyways. Let's just, let's just go down this path of self-destruction. It's really going to be fun, and we're just going to go for it because I just want to destroy my life. It's going to be great. Like, nobody thinks like that, right? No, we, we sin because we're deceived, and we believe the lie of sin. Do you know what the lie of sin is? The lie of sin is, is the, the lie that things will go better if we go this way. Things will go better if we go this way. We don't, we don't even call it sin. We call it, this is my best intentions. I've got really good ideas here. This is really going to work. This is really the plan. This is really what we should do. And we're deceived because actually that's exactly the opposite of what we should do. So we're, we buy into the lie that things will go better if we go our way over going God's way. That, uh, that, you know, we don't do it because we think, oh, destruction awaits us. No, we do it because we think, my way is actually a better idea. I got a better idea, and I'm going to follow it. The other reason that we sin is because um, the, the charge of the moment entices us, right? The charge of the moment entices us, and even though we know that there's probably going to be some misery and some consequences that are going to come with this, the charge of the moment is worth it. The charge of the moment is worth it, and so we go with that. And we're just like, well, we'll just deal with the, the misery and the consequences that come after, after. Right now, we just want to experience the charge of the moment, so let's go for it. And this is why people, this is why people sin. And most of the time when people are sinning, they don't even realize that, that what they're doing is, is wrong. They might even be convinced that it's right. But the Bible, the Word of God, is alive and active. And the word of God is what is sharper than any double-edged sword. Think of like a, a, a surgeon performing a surgery on us, like a scalpel that's, that's with precision cutting deep down inside of us, penetrating into us so that it reveals in us our true attitudes and thoughts of the heart. Right? This is what, this is what the word does. And this is actually a good thing because we don't want to be deceived we want to know the truth about where things are at. You know, the Bible says in James, it talks about how the Bible is like a mirror. You know, when you, when you look into the mirror, some of us, as we get older, we're not that impressed. We look into the mirror, though, and very few people look into the mirror and then go, well, it's good enough for today, and walk away. Right? You look into the mirror, and you, you go, oh, 
I need to do a bit of an evaluation here. I need to go, hmm, some things there that I, I need to adjust or change or, uh, you know, comb my hair, cut my hair, um, put on some deodorant, put some lotion on my face, trim up my beard if you're me, you know, whatever it might be. But you, you've got to, you know, make some adjustments. And this is what it's saying here. It's saying, uh, verse 12, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. It judges the thoughts and attitudes. Or some of you might say, it does an evaluation on our thoughts and attitudes. It's a little bit like this. You know, if you're going to buy a used car, let's say, you're going to buy a used car, and you notice that, you know what, it's a pretty good deal that you got on this car. Like, this car, you've, you've done a lot of research, and you've, you've kind of, priced everything out and you feel like this car is about priced at about five or maybe even like about five thousand dollars let's say five thousand dollars less than what you think it's worth so you're going got to be a catch there right like why is this car so much less than all the other cars similar to it same year same mileage and everything well, why why is it so much better why, why, why is the price so much better you're like, there's got to be a catch if you're smart. You're, you're like, there's got to be a catch. So what you'd want to do, if you really could do this, is you'd want to like say, hey, I, I want to buy this car, but first I want to take it to my friend here, the mechanic, and he's going to go inside and outside this car and up and down this car, and he's going to evaluate the car and find out if there's something drastically wrong with the car and the reason for why it is, you know, $5,000 less than what it should be. Now, if... If you're just somebody like most of us, and you, you, know, you, you go and you say, well, the car looks good, I don't see too much rust, and you know, if you put the hood up, you take a little look at the engine, you're like, yeah, I don't see anything kind of completely wrong here. Um, yeah, sure, let's buy the car, right? You, you're, you're taking a big risk with that because you, know, you might have it for a week or two and you realize pretty quickly why it was $5,000 less than all the other cars that you looked at that were very similar. This is the idea what God's word does. It evaluates the truth about our innermost attitudes and thoughts of the heart. And then it goes on to say in verse 13, it says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So now the, now the truth is, is not only do, does the word evaluate everything that's true about us, but also, God knows everything about detail about our lives. And at this point, I think as we're reading through this and as we're realizing that the author of Hebrews is telling us, hang on tight to your faith. Don't miss the rest that is available to you. And then you think about how the word goes down deep and how it evaluates the deepest, most innermost thoughts of our heart and our lives. And he gives us this evaluation if you will and then you think about how god is a god who sees everything you know and P, one of the reasons we are so easily we so easily self-deceive ourselves is because we're kind of taught that in life and maybe you've had this experience you were given a position or an opportunity a responsibility a job maybe and you felt right away you felt like way in over your head you felt like this is beyond my, my ability. This, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not equipped. I don't have the training. I don't have the experience. I don't have um, what I need to do this job well. But you're in this job. And what do people tell you if you're in a situation like that? They tell you to fake it till you make it, right? Like just pretend. Pretend like, don't, don't go in there and go, oh, yeah, I'm weighing over my head here. This is, I'm never going to be able to accomplish this. This is going to be a total colossal disaster. No, you go in and you pretend that you're good. You're confident. You got this. You can handle this. And you fake it. And then eventually, hopefully, if you fake it well enough, eventually you might figure it out as you go along and you might actually find that, hey, I, I can actually do this. And we do stuff like that in our life. And sometimes it works. And because of that, we get pretty good at sort of fooling people into thinking we got it all together. But there's one person we can never fool. 
We can fool ourselves. We can fool our own family members. We can fool people at the church. We can fool people at our work. But there's somebody who will never be fooled. And that's what we read in verse 13. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Mm. So at this point in the passage, we should be ready to call out a prayer. And it reminds me of um, when I was um, tree planting back in the day. I was a tree planter. Um, it's probably the hardest job I ever did, yeah, in, in, physically anyways. And all the pastoring is definitely harder than that, but um, not in a physical sense. Tree planting is harder yeah, physically. Anyway, physically... Tree planting, difficult job. You basically put about a 55 to 60 pound pack of trees onto your back with these bags and you go up and down the mountain all day long planting trees. And your hands are, you're bending down constantly like 2,000 times in a day and you're pushing this tree into the ground, opening it up with a shovel and this kind of thing. And it's pretty easy to do it like once or twice or maybe even 100 times, but do it 2,000 times, you get pretty worn down and tired, right? Now, on top of that, what was particularly tough about tree planting was is that, like, when you got back to your camp, it wasn't a camp like a logging camp. It was like, you know, some ground and a tent. And then you did have someone cooking your food for you, but you had to pay that person out of your work every single day. They would take the first, you know, $30 or whatever that you'd make. This is 20 years ago now. Um, out of your salary so that you could pay for your camp fees. And on top of all that, once in a while, it was your turn to do the dishes for the whole camp. So it got to be my turn to do the dishes for the whole camp, me and two or three other guys, and we did them all. And then there was like some confusion in the schedule. And somehow in the same week, I got put back on dishes again. And this would take like a couple of extra hours after supper, after you've worked all day, to do all the dishes. And I wasn't impressed because I was like, it is not my turn to do the dishes tonight. Like, I, I do not want to spend that extra two hours right now doing this. And, and there was this one guy on our, on our planting crew who wasn't a believer. And he was kind of like, you know how the enemy just works and he just, yeah, okay, I'm gonna, this is an opportunity here to really get to Dawn. And so he, he started kind of like, oh, look who's on dishes again tonight. <laughs> and I was just about ready to kill him. And, and so anyway... I just, I, I just, I was just, everything in me, I was just like, I just got to hold it together. I just got to hold it together. I just, I just got to fake it till I make it. Like inside of me, I'm just, but I, I just got to look like it's okay. I'm okay with this. I'm okay. And I just, but I was mad. And so I went to the back and I started washing these dishes and I'm washing these dishes like as fast and as hard as I can wash them. Like they're getting washed, right? But like, I am like not impressed. And then it's finally time, like, it's dark now. Like, I wake up, it's barely light, and then and now, now it's dark. I've worked in, the entire day. When I haven't been sitting and eating, I've been working constantly. Very, very physically taxing. And I remember just going to sleep that night, and I always pray before I go to sleep. And my prayer was the shortest prayer I'd ever prayed that night. And my prayer was, help. <laughs> that was it. That was it. Just help, Lord, help, help. And then I went to sleep. And I tell you all that because at this point in the passage, as we think about how the word of God goes down deep and reveals the deepest, most darkest, most deceptive thoughts and attitudes of our heart, and how God knows all, he knows every intricate detail, and we will have to give an account for everything, we should be at this point praying that prayer. Help. Help. And that's where we go in verse 14. Therefore. What is therefore, therefore? Well, it's therefore this. Since we have a great high priest. Now this is a little tough for us to, to coldly get it. Because you have to realize that the original author of Hebrews was writing to the original recipients of this book called Hebrews. And these were people who came from a Judeo, a Judeo, Christ, not Christian, a Judeo background. They were Jews. They, they followed Judaism, which was the, the religion of the Jewish people. So they knew what it, 
a, a, a high priest was. We read it today and we're like, I don't get it. High priest. Why is a high priest so important? I'm just going to talk about that briefly in a second. But verse 14 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Okay. So, what is this about a high priest? Well, the priest was the one who stood before the people and he would represent the people to God. You see, God, when God came down at the Mount Sinai and there was, the, the, the mountain, as it says, was on fire. Like this is quite a, a sight to behold. The mountain is on fire. And this is looking like God is really upset and we do not want to go on our own to God. So good news, we've got a priest, a high priest, who will go and represent us. He will take our place. He will go before God for us as our representative. The high priest's responsibility was also to come back to the people on behalf of God and represent God to the people. So if you wanted to have a relationship with God, you basically had to have a relationship with God vicariously through the priest. Right? So, that, that, that was the concept of, of, of a high priest. Someone who would represent the people to God and someone who would represent God to the people. And this is how you had a relationship with God back then. So now, he says, we have a great high priest. We have someone who will go on our behalf before the Father. And we have someone who on behalf of the Father will come and represent us. And will represent the Father to us. And his name is Jesus the Son of God, and, and, and what, what, what has he done? Well, he has ascended. We have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven. Tells us that he's not dead. He's, he's alive. And this is what we talked about a couple weeks ago when we, when we celebrated the resurrection, how Jesus rose from the dead. That he's alive. And he's representing us. And verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. For we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. You know, sometimes we get this idea that the people who are really experts in temptation and giving into evil are people who have a, a very, very dark, sordid background filled with lots of, you know, Hollywood kind of like story that a person has had of like just the sheer destruction that they've been through and they've experienced in their life. And if you want to know about the pitfalls and about the hardships and about how evil evil can be, that is the kind of person that you want to talk to. C.S. Lewis made it known though that he said actually that's completely backwards. The one who knows how difficult temptation is is the one who resists temptation time and time again. You see, if we're somebody who, when temptation comes, we just give in to it, we really haven't known how hard it is because we just gave in right away. When we resist temptation, temptation gets more and more difficult. So Jesus, our great high priest, he knows how difficult temptation is more than anyone. Because he's the one who consistently, time and time again, resisted temptation. He was tempted in every way that we are, yet was without sin. And that, that's an important thing for us to consider. Is that because he is God's representative to the people, that he's not somebody who's aloof and, yeah, he's up there in heaven and he doesn't really know what we go through in this world and he doesn't know how tough it can be and he doesn't know how challenging it is to resist temptation. No, he knows. He knows. And in his experiential knowledge of how hard it is to deal with temptation, he doesn't criticize and condemn us. He empathizes with us. He sympathizes with us. This is the kind of high priest that we want. And he has ascended into heaven, and right now we're told that he sits at the right hand of the Father. We've talked about this a little bit lately, but I want to just stress it again. Why does our great high priest sit at the right hand of the Father? 
When, when does somebody sit down? When they're done, right? When Jesus came and he paid the price for our sin on the cross, he said, it is finished. And then he ascended into heaven and he sits down at the right hand of the Father because he is finished. He's done. He has paid the price for our sin, past, present, and future. And he not only has done all that, but he also can empathize with our struggles. So what a great, what a great one to have to help us. Verse 16. So then with all this in mind, we've got this high priest who has paid the perfect price that's been accepted, that has been the perfect representative of the people to the Father and of the Father to the people. Then it says in verse 16, so then let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You know, ancient Jewish rabbis used to teach that God has two thrones. He has a throne of judgment and when it is time for him to bring the wrath, to bring the judgment, to bring us what we deserve, he sits on his throne of judgment. And then they would teach that there's also a throne of grace and that if, if we need grace and mercy and, and God feels in his goodness of his heart and his love for us that he wants to offer us grace and mercy, then he sits on his throne of grace and mercy. They would teach this. Well, what the Hebrew author is saying here is that God only has one throne. He only has one throne. And what throne is that? That's a throne of grace and mercy. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Why are we so slow to approach God's throne? Because we're taught, right, from a very young age, that if you're good today and you behave and you do what mommy and daddy asked you to do, then you're going to get something good. But if you've been bad and if you haven't obeyed and you haven't done what mom and dad asked you to do today, then you're going to get punishment. And we're taught this when we're young and then as we get older, it gets ingrained in us more and more and more. To the point now where when we think about, oh, I've got problems going on in my life right now. I've got challenges. I've got obstacles that just are too big for me to handle. We don't go to his throne. Why? Because we know we can deceive ourselves pretty good, but we know that when you really get down deep, when you really get into the, 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 the deepest, most intricate details of any one of our lives, we haven't been good enough. We don't have good things coming our way. We've got judgment coming our way because we've been bad. And so we don't come. But the author here of Hebrews is, is imploring us to realize that God only has one throne. And that is a throne of grace and mercy. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Grace, what is grace? Grace is getting what we don't deserve. Getting what we don't deserve. That's what grace is. Whenever you hear the word grace, just think receiving something that you didn't deserve. That is the throne of, of God, God's throne. God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy. What's mercy? Mercy is getting what we don't deserve. I mean, it, mercy is, is not getting what we do deserve. So what do we deserve? Well, we deserve punishment. But God is merciful to us. He doesn't want to punish us. So we receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I think it, it, it's not um, it's, it's not just a symbolism kind of thing. It's not just symbolic. That when Jesus died, he died with his arms wide open. Right? They were stretched out, right? They were, they were wide open. Because what he was saying to us as he was dying was he was saying, 
My arms are wide open. Come. Come to me. This is how you receive the rest. You don't receive the rest by earning the rest. You receive the rest because Jesus has opened his arms to us and he said, my throne is a throne of grace and mercy. So all you need to do is come. Trust. Have faith. Believe. And not just for your salvation. That is the most important part, that we would do that for our salvation, for forgiveness of our sin. But do that when you're having one of those days like I was having out tree planting. Where at the end of the day, you just feel like the waves of challenge of life have just poured over you, and you can barely stand up, and you're so tired of faking it till you make it. Instead, come. Let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive. He has good things for us. You say, no, not for me, because I've been bad. No, (laughs) that's missing it. He has good things for you, and he knows. He knows everything about you. See, in, in verse 13, back to verse 13 quickly, nothing in all creation is hidden from him. It's like, we think, well, I think he's missing something, because if he really knew about me, he'd have nothing good for me. No, he knows everything about you, and then you're implored through his word to come. And when you come, you will receive. If you have the faith to come, don't let that which has been ingrained in us, if I'm good, I'll receive good things. If I'm bad, I'm going to receive punishment. That's the way it is. Nothing can ever change that. No, when you need help, and God knows everything about how much you deserve or don't deserve, he says, come. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So what are you facing today? What are the challenges that you're going through? What, where do you need more wisdom? Where do you need more resources? Where do you need more help? Are you coming? Are you asking? Are you coming to his throne of mercy and grace? Are you coming with the faith that gives you confidence that you will receive what you need? Come. Let's pray. Father, we do want to come, and we come today recognizing that you um, sit on a throne of mercy and grace, and we are so thankful for that. That even when the word reveals to us how far we fall short of the standard, that standard of perfection, that standard of holiness, that standard of just perfect righteousness, we miss it. And we can get really good at fooling other people, so good that we can even fool ourselves, but we know that we can never fool you. And so, Lord, I just pray that as we become more aware of that, and as your word makes us more aware of that, we would not run from you realizing what we deserve, but that we would approach your throne of mercy and grace and receive what we need, whatever it might be today. There might be some here today, Lord, who what they need more than anything else is what we all need, and that is the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through him. And if you're stirring in someone's life, even right now, to make that decision, I pray that they would do it today. Lord, for many of us, it's, it's, it's we need more wisdom. We need more resources. We need more um, help with whatever it is that we're facing. And Lord, I pray that we wouldn't just try to handle it in our own, but that, Lord, we would just really think about your throne of mercy and grace and how we can bring those things to you. We can bring those requests to you and know that you will reward us. And we're thankful for that, Lord. We're thankful for that. And so, Lord, may this, may this passage be a passage that really um, encourages us to, to come. Because that's what you do. You held your arms wide open and you said, come. And so, Lord, we're coming today. We want to come every day. And we just pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.